Welcome to this webinar on sound in the built environment. This is part of a series we've been doing. Um, you may have joined in on some of the other ones uh, that we've been doing the last couple of weeks. Um, so today we're going to be discussing um, the importance of noise as a design consideration and looking at some various factors to do with that. My name is Rebecca Hogg and I am the acoustic consultant within a BizRear test department and uh, I will be going through the uh, webinar with you today. So a couple of bits of housekeeping before we uh, move on to the, the formal uh, webinar. So this webinar is being recorded and a copy will be available at a later date. You have all been muted. So if you do have any questions during this webinar, then please use the questions box in your control bar. Um, I'll, we'll be keeping on the questions during uh, the presentation, but there's going to be a uh, majority of the questions will be uh, discussed at the end and there'll be a time for questions then. So today we're going to be looking at what is making the noise, how noise is measured, what impact does noise have, and how is noise controlled? So what is making the noise? Um, it's useful at this point to kind of go back to basics and look at a couple of definitions. So the definition of sound is any pressure variation in the air that the human ear can detect. And noise is any sound that is unwanted. Now, often these two uh, parameters are used interchangeably. And uh, you might see the words noise and sound used uh, in guidance and documentations um, and even this webinar, and they will not necessarily mean they're, they're pure definitions. And any moving or vibrating part of a product can produce noise, and this noise will vary with the operation of a product. So some examples could be you know, a fan's rotational speed changes and the noise produced by the fan changes. So let's look at uh, a few common noise sources that you might find in your um, in the built environment. You've got outdoor uh, sources of noise, external sources such as traffic, uh, railways and so on. You've got building services noise. So this could be um, things like uh, the, the ductwork running through the building, pumps in a plant room, fan call units and, and grills and so on. And then you've got the other occupants of your building that can also be uh, a noise source to you. But at the moment, everything has changed. And for many of you, you might have a working environment that looks like one of these. You might have uh, children making a bit of noise in the background. If you're working from home, you might be uh, doing a lot of conference calls uh, and Skype uh, or, or other softwares, um, and, and and that might be what your, your environment is. Um, also, some people that are used to working in very busy environments and, and enjoy that, enjoy the hubbub of an office, are actually now working um, independently in, in isolated rooms from one another um, in their homes, and that also can be um, different to normal and not necessarily enjoyable. So there's two kind of types of, of noise. Noise produced by a product um, will be transmitted through the air and this is called airborne noise. And sources of airborne noise can include fans, compressors, pumps and motors. Now vibration is transmitted through structures and may be radiated as noise by com connected components and this is called structure borne noise. Sources of structure borne noise include casing and ductwork and are typically hard to harder to identify and control than airborne noise sources. So if you look at the diagram here on this slide you can see the purple arrows indicate paths of airborne noise and the orange arrows paths of structure borne noise. So let's move on to how is noise measured. There are various points in the uh, design and build process where noise measurements can be carried out. Prior to um, installation on site, you can carry out uh, laboratory testing of products. Uh, and or, or even mock-ups of the design in order to determine the uh, noise levels or the sound power level of a product. 
It could be testing during construction or pre-completion testing, such as sound insulation testing for uh, residential dwellings. Or it could be afterwards, once the building is built um, and maybe there's been a noise complaint and somebody um, and you're responding to doing testing in a response to, to um, someone being annoyed by the noise. And it can be either be in accordance with standards or um, bespoke site specifications. So there are three, three main types of measurements that can be carried out. These are the determination of sound power or sound pressure. Um, the determine, and that's things that make sound, uh, determination of sound absorption coefficients, things that absorb sound, and the determination of sound transmission, how much noise goes through something. So if you look at the diagram on this slide, you've got a product that produces a certain noise, so that'll be your sound power. Uh, sound absorption maybe of a, a wall tile, illustrated there by the green uh, rectangle, or transmission through a, a wall into an adjoining area. So it's important um, before we look at these three different types of measurements to understand the difference between sound power and sound pressure. And this is a, a, a much um, confused topic sometimes for people uh, and understand the difference between the two. So a, a basic analogy that we can use this to explain the difference between sound power and sound pressure is in fact heat. So if you imagine a room and uh, inside that room there is a heater and, and that electric heater would emit a certain amount of heat similar to the sound power emitted by a sound source. Now in order to quantify the heat emitted by that heater temperature measurements might be taken around the room and the measured temperatures would vary around the room due to the distance from the source, uh, surface materials or maybe airflow patterns and they're dependent on the thermal characteristics of the room. Now in the same way uh, sound pre uh, the sound pressure levels can vary around a room and are dependent on the acoustic environment. So if we now look at a sound source in a room, um, such as an air conditioning unit, it will be located in a room and it emits a sound power and that's expressed in watts. The sound power emitted radiates away, away from the source, causing small fluctuations in the air pressure around the room, much like the ripples on a pond. Now sound power can't be measured directly, however the pressure fluctuations can and are expressed in pascals. So the sound pressure will vary around the room and can be measured using microphones and it will depend on the specific acoustic environment of the room and the distance from the sound source. And the sound pressure measured at different locations in the room will differ even if the sound power emitted by the, uh, by the unit remains constant. Now, um, both sound power levels and sound pressure levels are presented using the decibel unit, which can cause some confusion, but it's really important to remember that sound pressure levels do not equal sound power levels and are two different parameters used. Determined sound power levels are independent of the acoustic environment and therefore useful when comparing two products. Sound pressure levels are dependent on the specific acoustic environment and therefore useful when determining compliance on site or dealing with noise complaints post installation. So let's look at some common test methodologies that can be used in order to measure the different parameters. So first we're going to look at sound power levels and their determination. So there's a series of standards um, and there's one specifically called uh, BSA EN ISO 3741 which looks at the measurement and determination of sound power levels uh, in a reverberation chamber which is a precision environment. And there are a number of um, specific test standards to deal with certain types of products, for example, heat pumps, air conditioners, or fan cool units. Now, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with energy labels um, on your domestic appliances at home, such as your fridge and your washing machine. And the same applies for heat pumps and air conditioners. And on those uh, energy labels, they also include a determined sound power level. And this really helps uh, manufacturers, uh, installers, suppliers to compare two products and, and look at the different noise levels that they would produce. So let's move on to the second type of noise measurements, sound absorption. So sound absorption is um, determined in accordance with BSEN ISO 354. And that is a um, different materials can be designed to absorb sound. So wall and ceiling panels, um, duct lining, case materials, um, and different screens and barriers used in um, the different built environments. 
And for this type of measurement, you determine a sound absorption coefficient, how um, absorptive is the material, where zero is fully reflective and one would be fully absorptive. So typically something um, like an acoustic panel that might be used on a wall, that would typically have a sound absorption coefficient of maybe around 0.8 or 0.9. Now, the third and final type of um, acoustic measurement that we're going to be looking at today is sound transmission. And so there are various products that are designed to minimize the transmission of noise um, through them. And there's two types of descriptors used. Firstly, insertion loss. Um, insertion loss is used to describe the sound reduction of silencers and attenuators. And there is a specific test diet for that. Now, if you're looking at the sound reduction through walls, floors, windows, um, the building fabric, then the terminology sound insulation or sound reduction is more likely to be used. And there are three paths of sound transmission that are often looked at. External noise sources, such as traffic being transmitted into the building. Building noise sources um, th uh, being transmitted into the surrounding environment and potentially causing a noise nuisance to um, adjacent occupants of buildings. And also through ductwork in buildings. Now, when you were looking previously at sound power or sound pressure levels, the higher the value, the noisier the piece of equipment. But in this case, with sound transmission, the higher the value, the more noise that product will stop. So finally, in terms of measurements, I'm just going to touch on open plan offices. These are slightly different environments in which to measure in. And there is a specific test standard for them, uh, BSE and ISO 3382-3, which was released a number of years ago. And in those environments, it's important to consider um, parameters such as speech, intelligibility and privacy. And that will look at how um, well people can hear and communicate and understand each other within an open plan office environment. Obviously, if you had very high noise levels, um, that means you potentially couldn't communicate with each other. But equally, if you have very quiet offices, that can also cause a problem with privacy. Um, suddenly your, your telephone conversation can be heard with the whole, from the whole office and that's not necessarily what you want. So there, is, uh, there are numerous standards and guidance on um, different, for different uh, measurements and, and things. And just a couple of them I want to just briefly mention to you now. Firstly, we have a Bizria guide on understanding acoustic performance data. Um, and this kind of goes through, if you're looking at data specification sheet, what you would look at. And another a useful piece of guidance, uh, it is 104 pages long, I'll warn you, is SIBSI guide B4. But this really goes into a lot of information about noise and vibration control for building services system and is a useful reference documentation. So, moving on, what impact does noise have? Any of you that have been uh, listening to my uh, colleague Blanca's uh, webinars will already have been spoken on on the topic of building wellness. And there are a number of different um, parameters and, and, and classifications within this and within the physical classifications for indoor environmental quality. There is the indoor air quality, light, thermal comfort, odors and noise. And this is that's that's where noise fits into the building wellness um, framework. So there are five main ways that noise can impact on our health and well-being. The first is a sleep disturbance. It's not surprising, I'm sure any of you would, would agree, that if you are in a noisy environment, uh, maybe a lot of traffic noise outside or trains or something like that, then you would be disturbed by how uh, your sleep would be disturbed. What's also important to note in this respect is it's not just the um, noise level, but also the frequency of the events. So uh, it might be that having if you're near a railway line having a lot of trains passing by at night would be disturbing um, physiological function that has to do with uh, your overall health uh, and well-being and there has been some studies that showed that noise can impact on people's stress levels um, and that can lead to to other health effects and then performance speech intelligibility and annoyance which we're going to cover in a little bit more detail now so speech intelligibility, how easy is it to understand someone else talking to you? 
Now, speech intelligibility is affected by a number of different parameters. The speech level, how loud is someone talking in the first place, um, how they are pronouncing, uh, the distance between people, um, background noise levels, um, reverberation time. Reverberation time is a measure of how reverberant the space is. Um, hearing acuity, do, do people have a hearing loss of any kind? And level of attention, if you're not paying attention, you won't necessarily hear what someone else is telling you. And there are a couple of basic uh, rules used, um, and one of them is that the background noise should be at least 15 decibels lower than the speech level in order for you to understand what someone else is saying. And also uh, the reverberation time should be between 0.8 and one second in office spaces, again, to aid speech intelligibility. If you have a very echoey environment, you can struggle to understand speech, but equally, if it is a, um, if, the, if there isn't enough reverberation within space, that can also stop the sound from propagating through the area. Annoyance. I'm sure all of you at one time or another have been annoyed by noise. And in the built environment, there are a number of factors that can affect this. But one of the main ways to avoid annoyance is to understand your building occupants and educate them and give them control of the spaces and provide different spaces for different tasks. If people are trying to work quietly uh, on independent tasks, some, it is often useful to give them a private um, work area so that they can work without being disturbed. If people equally are having trying to have a conversation, discuss a piece of work, it's not the best thing to all be in the open plan office together discussing that necessarily. And so a private meeting room for a few people might be a better option. There's another factor in terms of giving people control of uh, the building services themselves. Um, some people would agree or disagree whether this is a good thing or not. But um, if people have control, then they can make their own decisions on something. Now, a very simplistic example of this is someone is too hot in their environment and so they turn up the uh, the cooling system or maybe they uh, open a window and that would then cause them to have noise say from traffic noise outside and that might be disturbing in terms of noise but they want to be cooler so they then have a choice of uh, what kind of environment they want to work in and what factors would affect them most and so all these factors could help avoid people being annoyed by noise performance. So noise has been proved to contribute to stress and illness over time and it has um, also looked at studies have also looked and shown that productivity can plummet two-thirds less productive if you've got in a noisy environment. Multitasking becomes difficult, you get stressed, less motivated. And a study a few years ago by Lessman showed that um, office occupants consider noise to be of 75% importance. They consider it to be a pretty important factor within their work environment, but only about a third of people were satisfied with the acoustic environment. So there's definitely a way and a room for improvement for people. Now I'm just gonna to touch upon psychoacoustics. This is a, a relatively new um, area of study. And it's a study looking at the psychological and physiological responses associated with sound. <coughs> it's more to do with your personality type, um, your control um, and the type of activity you're trying to carry out and in fact, individual factors. So if you, uh, I'd like to, you to think, are you an extrovert or are you an introvert? I'd also like you to think, do you like working in a quiet environment or a noisy environment? Now, a study a few years ago showed that the personality type can affect how you work in different environments. So this table here shows that if you were considered yourself to be an introvert personality type, that you enjoy working in quiet environments, whether you're working on a simple or a complex task. However, an extrovert won't like working uh, in a quiet environment when they're carrying out a simple task. And so if you're someone that is currently having to work from home by yourself, you might find that actually difficult to concentrate because you're used to working and enjoy working with other people, with other noise, with other activity around you. And so it's it's an interesting um, point to consider that the acoustics and the, in the built environment isn't just about the the overall noise levels, but it's also about who the building occupants are, what they're trying to activities they're trying to carry out in that space and how they would be affected by that. 
Finally, I'm uh, just going to look at noise-induced hearing loss. There are 12 million people in the UK that have some form of hearing loss, and that's about 15% of the population. Now, if you um, attended any kind of site, a construction site, you or a noisy factory, you may have been offered ear defenders to use. Um, and I'm sure you wouldn't have um, objected to wearing them because uh, it would have stopped you from ha experiencing a hearing loss, uh, it stopped you from having any hear uh, ear damage to your ears. Now, one of the biggest factors, in fact, of noise induced hearing loss is, uh, is, is people wearing individual headphones. And I don't know if you are wearing headphones potentially right now listening to this webinar. And they've been found to be a big cause of hearing loss and tinnitus for people. And it's important, um, therefore, if you do wear headphones a lot, to, to make sure that the volume in them is, is appropriate. If someone next to you can hear what is uh, the, the noise through your headphones, they're too loud. Take breaks. Don't wear them all day, every day. Take breaks uh, from wearing them. Uh, and also think about getting some good quality um, headphones if you're going to be wearing them a lot for your work. So like the noise cancelling headphones and so on that will help block out background noise and therefore mean you can turn the volume down on them and still be able to hear whatever it is you want. And all these things will help protect your hearing. Um, hearing loss is something that can occur slowly over time, but it is permanent. So it's often uh, not something that people think about, but is important. How is noise controlled is our final section of this webinar. So there are a number of points that uh, in ways in which noise control can be carried out. At the source, uh, during the transmission path or at the receiver. So at the source, it's to do with the design of the, of the uh, product itself and any say uh, design features such as anti-vibration mounts. Transmission path, that is looking at things that uh, stops the noise being transmitted through and the receiver who are the sensitive receptors to noise what's the layout like and things like that now noise control has to be considered in conjunction with other design requirements for example uh, the cost of putting these things in um, the space the layout um, where are other building services going to go the lighting the, the the plumbing all those kind of things and so it must be considered with with other design factors uh, factors in consideration. So I'm just going to look at give you a few examples here of noise control at the various points at source, transmission and at receiver. Now I've got a couple of sound clips and I'm hoping that you will be able to hear these. Let me just turn up the volume. So this is a uh, graph which is showing the sound power level of a heat pump for um, two heat pumps and the a uh, dark blue line is for one heat pump and the light blue line is for the other. The sound power level at one side and frequency along the bottom. Frequency is akin to the musical idea of pitch, low frequency, low pitch, uh, high frequency, high pitch. And the overall A weighted sound power level determined for the product with the dark blue line was 59 decibels. And the overall um, sound power level of the <coughs> product with a pale blue a line was 40 decibels. And they sounded like this. Hopefully you'll be able to hear this. That's the first product. And this is the second product. And obviously one was much quieter than the other there. And these uh, two heat pumps were exactly the same capacity operating at exactly the same conditions, uh, two different heat pumps. And it just shows you what can be done by considering the um, initial design of the heat pump. So things like the anti-vibration, how is the casing designed and so on. And those principles are applicable to all the different types of products. And so looking at the beginning at the design phase, making them as quiet as possible at that point means you don't have to then deal with the noise issue um, further down the design chain. <coughs> now in that last example, I used frequency along the bottom. So why bother with frequency? This idea of looking at uh, the pitch of the noise, not just the overall noise level. Now, these two uh, sound sources here and these, these boxes, A and B, both have an overall sound power level of 75 decibels. 
So you think they're they're similar? They're they're the same. We can we can look at them in the same way. They both got the same noise level. However, hopefully you'll be able to hear this clip. Source A sounds like this. And source B sounds like this. For anyone that couldn't hear those noise clips, then source A was kind of an overall rumbling noise and source B sounded very high pitched squeaking noise, uh, more, of a, more of a tinny uh, noise. And the, the kind of the graphs of those would be like that. And why it's important, therefore, to look at the frequency spectrum of these products is it allows you to select appropriate noise control and select the appropriate products. So noise control products such as attenuators are designed to and can stop noise um, to a greater or lesser extent at different frequency bands. So the uh, green source A had more low frequency noise and source B had more high frequency noise. Now, if you used a product to stop and control the noise from source A that was designed to only stop high frequency noise, you wouldn't really have a lot of effect on the overall noise level. And therefore, knowing the frequency bands of the source noise that you're trying to control helps you pick the most appropriate product to control that noise with. Noise control through transmission. There's a number of different ways. You can often, this is through ductwork in buildings, um, water flow pipes and such like. If you look at the diagram on the top um, right hand side, the, the sketch from the SIBSI guide, this is an example of when crosstalk attenuators can be used. So if airflow through flows through the duct from left to right and is fed into those two office spaces, then um, then that's how, how, the, how the airflow, the ventilation is provided those spaces. But noise is lazy. Noise always goes through the path of least resistance. It doesn't go through that wall. It'll go back through that nice open ductwork and then be transmitted from right to left. So from that noisy large meeting room to that quiet working space. And that can cause annoyance. So there are products called cross talk attenuators, which can be used and installed in these applications to avoid this uh, noise transmission. Also, if you um, can look at the just the general layout of a building in the picture on the bottom right, we've got an example of a meeting room and then there's a working open plan office space, which you can't see just off to the left. Um, now, putting corridors in, um, dividing spaces up, keeping noisy and quiet source and quiet working areas away from each other will just stop uh, the transmission, uh, minimize the transmission noise and stop any kind of noise complaints or nuisance being caused. Finally, let's look at noise control at receiver um, in the in the receiving uh, space. So, for example, this could be a product that is installed and say you've got a specification that says the sound pressure level in your space has to be um, below 35 decibels. And you've got a product here with various fan speeds. And so you plot out the uh, sound pressure level in the space for the different fan speeds and you go, right, OK, fan speed three, that meets my criteria of 35 decibels. I can have it at fan speed one, two and three and it'll be fine. However, if then something happened at space, you needed, um, say, the occupants of the, of the room increased, the space increased, you needed to have a, a higher airflow rate and therefore you turned up the speed of your fan, you might would then find that the um, noise criteria wouldn't be met and this could be problematic. So um, it's important to consider how products are going to be used, what the space can be used for, and also not just look at uh, on a data sheet at the noise levels, but consider how wh how is the product operating to achieve those noise levels. On a data sheet, if you're looking at the quiet or a low speed operation, but you're always going to use your product at high speed, then that wouldn't be a very um, applicable value to look at. So I'm now going to look at noise control during installation and commissioning. So if we consider a system with two dominant noise sources, uh, a fan and a pump, and the specification of what they were trying to achieve in the system was to have a two litre second water flow rate and that the system shouldn't cause any noise nuisance. However, what was happening was they were only achieving one litre a second water flow rate 
with the highest pump speed and the higher noise levels from both the fan and the pump were causing a noise nuisance to nearby occupants of buildings. And it sounded like this. Now you may think the solution would be to look at new products to install, a new fan and maybe a, a more powerful pump. But in fact, the solutions were simpler than that. Firstly, the fan was casing was installed incorrectly and by refitting the fan casing this reduced the noise from the fan. Secondly it was found that during commissioning there was air in the pump system and by removing this air it allowed the system pressure drop to be reduced and the lower pump speed to be used in order to achieve the two litres a second water flow rate requirement and that in turn reduced the noise level. So the system went from sounding like this to sounding like this. I'm sure you'll agree, a much more pleasant noise environment. So there are a couple of stages uh, in the design, um, acoustic design consideration that have to be made. First at the beginning, look for meaningful acoustic data for products. As I mentioned, how are you going to be operating the product in real life? Um, have you got the data for it operating at those conditions? Noise sensitive areas are the particular areas, particular people that are using the um, space that are going to be sensitive to noise. Consider all the internal and external noise sources. Um, simple things like where windows are placed compared to um, external noise sources, um, where um, ventilation ductwork is, is placed um, and, and so on. Meeting rooms and such like layout design. Consider appropriate noise control measures. As I mentioned, um, look at the frequency bands of the noise being produced and pick an appropriate uh, control measure for the product. And considering the noise during design and um, during installation and commissioning. And it's really important if you consider noise at the beginning of the design process, it's the best way of preventing noise issues, not just um, the easiest, but also often the most cost effective for you. Um, trying to retrofit and, uh, and solve a noise issue once uh, an installation has been carried out, it can be a very costly and um, timely process. However, as I'm sure you're all aware, the situation at the moment is quite different for people um, in the built environment and a lot of office spaces are having to be made COVID secure and work environments are looking very different. And there are a number of ideas that have been um, used, that have been, um, that are being used, that are proposed to be used in the, in the built environment. I'm just gonna look at a couple of these now. Firstly, office spaces that are, or were open plan, large spaces for large groups of people are being split into smaller areas, partitions are being put up. Now, some of these are just um, using uh, plastic screens or, or the room dividers and of course that will change the acoustic environment of, of that space, change that reverberation time and the sound absorption that we, we spoke about earlier and that could affect people. Um, also people are working from home using teleconferencing and, and that can affect the acoustic environment. Um, spaces are being divided up potentially, separate rooms, um, looking at how spaces are used and so um, the building services, so the ventilation and, and so on, might be being used in a different way, providing heating, cooling, ventilation to different spaces than it was previously. Um, we've just heard at, at lunchtime the, the, the proposed date to reopen um, pubs and restaurants and, and hospitality facilities. And of course, um, with the distancing measures, they're going to be having to think about ventilation in a different way, potentially, and how their spaces are used and how those environments are used. And there's also things to do with the planning rules. Um, potentially some, some rules have been um, adapted or are going to be adapted in this, in this world. Construction sites are allowed to operate for longer hours to allow more shift working. And would that potentially cause a noise nuisance to um, occupants and nearby um, to pe people nearby? So there are a number of different acoustic um, considerations to be made, certainly now with the, with the changing world that we are living in. So that uh, concludes the presentation uh, that we have, uh, the webinar today on sound in the built environment. I hope you enjoyed it and thank you for listening.